Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. I'm about to preach for Word Wise Church. We're going to Isaiah chapter 61, and we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 4. And I thank you so much for asking me to do this. I thank God for every, for every chance to speak his word. And I hope and pray it touches you where God wants it to touch you. I'm not a typical preacher, so I may seem odd to you, to some of you, but I'm the type to shoot straight from the hip. So hopefully everything I say will be a blessing and nothing will be offensive. <laughs> God help me in Jesus' name. All right, Isaiah 61, starting at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Before I go any further on that, when we think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we see him on the cross, we see him uh, off the cross, and we see him raising from the tomb in the resurrection. But a lot of times what we don't see is why he bore so many stripes on his back. The Bible says by his stripes we are healed. But we lose sight of the fact that healing comes in a whole lot of forms. And one of the forms of healing is inner healing, psychological healing, spiritual healing, generational healing, emotional healing. And a lot of times we forget all of that or we don't hear it preached much at church because most of the time the focus of healing is on the body. But God goes deep down into the soul. He says it right here. Let's go to verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn. You know how many people come to church, come to the presence of God, go to work, go through their daily routines, mourning, and they don't even realize it because there's so much piled up on top. They don't get how badly they're mourning, but God does. To a, verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. In other words, you give him your ashes. I don't care how high the pile is. Give him your ashes and ask him to take out your trash and he will give you his beauty. And he's not too big, high and lifted up to take your trash out. All right. I got to stop there, Lord. Okay, I'm, I'm going to obey. Years ago, I heard a story. And in this story, it was a true story about a woman whose pastor dropped by the house unannounced. And it was one of those days, you and I know, when there's not a good time for anybody to drop by unannounced, when your toilet is stopped up. Now, this is going to sound gross, but I want you to hear how much God loves you and me. Listen to this. The man comes by in his Sunday go-to-meeting suit. He hadn't even changed his clothes. Service was over. Everybody was going home, and the Lord told him to go by this lady's house. And when the lady came to the door, she cracked the door and stood in the doorway because she was not going to let that man in her house. He said, God told me to come by, sister. How are you doing? And she said, well, uh, let me come on out and talk to you. He said, no. He pushes the door open, walks right by her and says, I know you got a problem. The Lord told me to come by and I came to solve your problem. And she is mortified. She is embarrassed. She can't figure out why would God have him come now of all times? Well, the man walks in. I want you to picture God's love in this illustration. It's a true story. The man walks right down her hallway, straight to the bathroom. He follows his nose. She had four days of family jewels piled up in that bathroom because the toilet was stopped up. Her husband was a construction worker being laid off at the moment where there was no money to pay a plumber. 
Imagine the stench in that house. He rolls up his shirt. He takes his blazer off, rolls up his shirt, gets on his hands and knees, reaches his bare arm into the mess, into the, oh, I don't even want to describe what it was. It's disgusting to think about it. And when he reached in, he found the, the clog and unclogged that, that pipe with his bare hand, pulls his hand out, down away goes troubles down the drain, and he cleans himself off and comes on out, says a prayer for the family, sits chat for a while, and heads on out the door. How many of you would do that in your own toilet, let alone someone else? That's how much God loves us. He will reach his holy hand down into your cesspool of horrors. And he will reach as deep as he has to reach to unclog your problems, to unclog your soul, to unclog your emotions. Why? Because God doesn't want you going through life limping. God doesn't want you hurting. God doesn't want you all bound up, tied up in knots. God wants you healed, whole, and together, living the abundant life full of peace, full of love, full of joy, and full of his presence. You can't enjoy the presence of the Lord when all you can see is problem over here, problem over there, problem everywhere. It's hard to look up when your head is hanging down. It's hard to hold your back up straight and walk straight and strong when you're bent over with a sack of weight on the on, hanging on you like that. It's very difficult. So this is what I'm here to remind all of us of. We all have to remind ourselves even that God is the God that will take the broken and he will put you back together again. He will reach back to that thing that happened to you when you were three years old and you were threatened or intimidated not to tell anybody. And God will get in that right there in that cesspool of horrors and reach down off. I mean, he will reach down so far. Everything that's piled up on top of it will be cleared out. And see, God deals with wound after wound after wound after wound. He never gets tired of healing our hurts. He never gets tired of putting us back together again. He never gets tired of us crying and asking him to come and deliver us. He never gets tired of that because that is part of why he was here. That is part of his ministry. Yes, what Jesus did on the cross is done. It's finished. But Jesus is still doing the work in us. We are a work in progress. All right, let's go to verse three. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. When was the last time you reached up and said, Lord, please take my ashes, take out this hurt, take out this pain, take out my idiosyncrasies, take out my hangups? When was the last time you asked God to do that? When was the last time you even addressed those things that haunt you day and night? The oil of joy he gives for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. How many saints are walking around overweight, not overweight with fat, not overweight with excess fluid, but overweight with the cares of this world, that they might be called trees of light. I'm sorry, trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This is what I love about God. His work is so thorough. He goes way down. He says in verse four, and they shall build the old wastes. There are things in your life you feel like have been wasted, have been lost for good, have been trashed. And God has said, uh-uh, they can be rebuilt. Restoration, baby. 
They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. All right, now let's go on and get down and dirty. Some of you have been going to church day in, day out, reading your Bible, praying to God at the top of your lungs, and never once said, Lord, what's really wrong with me? What's really going on? Not what sin have I committed. I'm not talking about that. Because believe it or not, a lot of times your sins are symptoms. They're not always because you're bent on sin. Sometimes it's because you're bent over with weights. And the Bible says that we are to shed the weights and the sin that so easily besets us. See, when you're weighed down, with cares, when you're weighed down with unresolved issues, when you're weighed down with emotional pain, what ends up happening is you end up becoming bitter, resentful, frustrated, short-fused. You, you, you got a temper that's two minutes long. You got a temper that won't even go a yard, it won't even go a foot. You may have two inches worth of temper, and then you're about to jump out, Jack's about to jump out the box. Because you don't realize you're reacting to something else. This is nothing but a catalyst, but that's the reason you're really going through changes. So you have to understand, there are times you have to sit down and bombard God with questions. What does the Bible say? Pray to the Father in the name of the Son. Ask God, Lord, what is wrong with me? And don't be too proud to admit something's wrong in the first place. Don't be too proud. Every one of us has things that God hasn't even addressed yet. We think, oh, yeah, we've come to this point. Thank God for healing. Thank God for deliverance. And God is saying, you have no idea what I still have to do inside of you. And I won't let you see it until I'm ready to deal with it. Now, let's go into how some of the ways God will deal with our situations. But first, I want to deal with some of the issues God brought to my attention. Some of us are suffering from issues of abandonment. And you know where that lies. You know where it comes from. Whether it's from your parents, from loved ones, from the other lover, whatever. You got issues with abandonment. Some of you have issues with jealousy. Because one of the siblings got it all and you feel like you got the crumbs. So you, you're dealing with jealousy on top of resentment. Some of you are dealing with insecurity. And let me say, the majority deals with the root, not just the surface, the root of rejection. I remember years ago when I came up, I mean, let's say half a century, over half a century ago, <laughs> my mother two years after I was born, ended up in an insane asylum. And as a result, I always share my personal stories. I don't mind telling my business. Some of y'all won't. But I tell it because I know it helps. My father used to do that, and it really helped me see light so much clearer through his mistakes. When I was a little kid, Two years old, my mother had a nervous breakdown, and they came and took her away. Well, in the meantime, after we were shipped here and shipped there and in an orphanage and all that, my father found where I was and came and got me out. Now, one of the issues that took place was she was married to another man, divorcing him and chasing after my father. And in the midst of chase, here I pop up. Yeah, and then along comes Patty. So now here she is, almost 40 years old. She's raised seven kids. She's not thinking about another one. So you can imagine the rejection that's already in the bloodline. 
And after they take her to the asylum, now my father has to find places and people to take care of me and pay them and buy groceries, clothes and all that because he's a working man, moving man, working 10 to 16 hours a day. So I saw him every weekend, but it was difficult. By the time I, we all decided to get back home after my mother was released from the asylum, I was so confused, I didn't even know he was my father anymore. But let me tell you, the rejection started. It really started when we all got together. I talked normal. I acted normal. I had no insecurities. I was fine. I did have abandonment issues. Because I would always think, you know, what if my father left me and never came back? I did have little issues like that. But when my mother came home, I was, I was her, uh, what do you call that, that, that board that they beat with, the one that, that you take everything out on. I was the whipping board. All right. So she was very insecure and she went through a lot of changes with my father because she was jealous and suspicious. And my father was too busy working, taking care of all her teenage kids from her former marriage and me to be out there chasing anything. He was too tired, too old. So what ended up happening was all the friction came from my mother. The argument started with her. She was always starting an argument. She was always unhappy, always uh, irritable about something. And she always had issues with me because I was his child. That man. Yeah. So my nickname became the V word, the thing that you call a female dog. That ended up being my nickname. And I would have to sit down and listen to how it was my fault and how I'm just like him and how everything messed up her life and blah, blah, blah for years. And if I wanted a hug from my mother, my mother would say, oh, Patty, make it quick. You know, you give me the creeps. I grew up with that, ended up stuttering at the age of seven. I don't know how I stopped at nine, but thank God that went away. And when I got saved at 27, by then I was totally convinced that I was jacked up, toe up from the flow up, and I needed some serious intervention here. So I started asking God to focus in on my emotional scars. And let me tell you, the first thing the Lord did when he started healing was gave me a dream that I was slapping the mess out of my mother. I would never do it in, in real life. But in this dream, I was enjoying it, you guys. And I was so scared when I woke up from that dream that I would actually enjoy hurting my mother. And the Lord said, I want to deal with that right there. We're going to heal. Now, he didn't criticize me for the anger. He didn't uh, correct me for having negative emotions. He was letting me know it was even there and that he wanted to heal. Well, as time went on and years went by, the first breakthrough dream I had was my mother not only allowed me to hug her, but she hugged me back. And I cried saying, Mama, this was all I ever wanted from you. The next thing that happened was I had a dream debating with her over the Bible. And when I woke up from that dream, the Lord said, now you no longer need your mother's approval. So every step was a progression to healing and deliverance. But the final deliverance from rejection, and I'm sharing this with you to show how God ministers to us as we open up to him to do so, you have no idea what God can do and how quickly he can do it until you start asking. What does the Bible say? You have not because you ask not. I was sitting on the couch one day. Somebody had made a little snide remark, not a big deal, but I couldn't cut it loose. It kept rolling around in my head on instant replay. And I finally got tired of it and said, Lord, why is that bothering me so much? That's a very good question to ask. When you want to ask God why, ask God those kind of questions. And before I knew it, God spoke clearly, rejection. And I said, well, what does rejection have to do with that? I said, okay, listen, I don't see it. But if you see it's rejection 
and you know what you're talking about, so I'm not even going to try to figure it out. Would you please get rejection out of me at the root? I'm tired of it having control over me. Why did I ask that? For two hours, I cried, sobbed, howled, yelled, and dry heaved all together for two solid hours. The kind of dry heaving that lunges you forward with every heave. Nothing came up but my big mouth and its noise. But after two hours, I felt like I had lost 200 pounds. I felt like a whole different person. I never had issues from that moment until now with rejection the way I had it before that. Yes, my feelings will get a little hurt, I, you know, but I take it right to God. Lord, take this hurt out immediately. I don't even let it get in there and settle. I immediately get it up and out because I know I don't have to live that way. Somebody makes you mad during the day. No, you don't have to be angry. You don't have to give in to their snide remark. You don't have to be hurt and offended all day long. You can say as soon as it comes out of their mouth, Lord, take it out of me. Don't even let it get in me. Don't even let me be hurt by that, Lord. Don't let it affect my day. Keep me filled with your peace and your joy. We have to lean that much harder in this day and age because the demons are doing everything to wear down the saints. We've got to be very careful to guard our hearts and we have to be very careful to allow God to get into our skeleton closets, to get into those basements where all your dark secrets are hidden. You got to get in there butt naked with God and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready for surgery. And you will find that the things that bothered you last year, the things that bothered you 40 years of your life don't even phase you anymore. That's how thorough God's healing is. See, once you remove the corn from your toe, you don't feel like socking somebody when they step on it because the pain isn't there. Yeah, you're going to feel their weight, but they're not going to cause you the pain that they would cause if you still had an infected corn on that toe. See, when it's healed, things don't hurt anymore. You realize that? When you get ready to walk through a crowd and you've got a sore spot or a real bad shoulder or a bad elbow, you're guarding that elbow. You're really being careful with it. Why? Because you're afraid somebody's going to bump it. And you know, when you feel pain, sometimes anger rises up just like that. Well, it's the same way when you're emotionally in pain. Even though you can't feel it right now, you wait till somebody bumps it. You wait till somebody pushes that button, says those magic words, and boy, Jack will jump up out the box so fast, you won't even be able to catch him because you're still limping through your wounds. But God is able to heal. God is able to remove the pain completely. You can remember the details and not be angry at Brother Sasquatch, not be angry and bitter towards Sister Appleseed. You don't have to feel it. The lump will be gone. The, 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 the knots, everything that had you tied up in knots will be gone miraculously. It's the craziest thing. I had a relative in my family that my mother knew about. She was the only one I told about who molested me. And that relative never apologized to this day. I didn't tell my father either because I knew my father would probably kill him. But do you know, I spent 15 years resenting, hating, and being bitter. When that person came around, I went to the other room. I would leave the house. I didn't even want to look at the person. I hated and enjoyed hating him. I wanted him to die so I could dance on his grave and throw a party, baby. And when I got saved and asked God, I read the word. That's why you got to be in the word. I read the word that said, if you don't forgive those who trespass against you, neither will your father forgive your sins that you trespass. So I'm looking at that saying, well, Lord, I don't want to forgive him. I was just being real. I don't want to forgive him. Look what they did. That 
one slapped me, that one raped me, that one did this, that one did that. I went down the list and I had their names on the list. I said, why do I have to forgive them? They never apologize. Why do I have to forgive this one? He gloats every time he sees me. Why do I have to forgive that one? He's arrogant as can be. And God didn't say a word. So I said, okay, look, if you want me to forgive, then I ask you to give me the ability because I don't want to and I can't. God did everything I asked. When I saw the perpetrators ran across them in the city, I couldn't believe the smile that came across my face. I was like, Lord, where did the resentment go? See, when you give things over to God, really give it, when you feel helpless and you know you can't do it yourself, you ask God for his help, you will find healing you didn't even know was available to you. You don't have to walk around being self-centered. Because the world cheated you when you were a kid. So you're going to look after number one, baby. You don't take care of me. I don't love you anymore. You don't have to live like that. Because that's another symptom of a wound that you have not addressed with the Lord. Don't walk around with a bunch of masks on your face. Don't walk around with your little costumes. Don't do that. Because you need to get butt naked with God. You want to grow. You want to see who you are meant to be. You want to experience freedom and inner peace the way that Jesus wanted you to experience it. You better go to God and get all the surgeries you can. Because the more he heals, the freer you are. The more he removes, the lighter your, your weight is. And everything that you can handle, give it to him. Lord, here is the way my parents treated me. Here is the way that man beat me up. Here is the way that woman took my money. Here is the way they lied on me. Take it all, Lord. I can't handle it. It's too heavy for me. And ask God to heal. I'm not going to take much more time because I know time is fleeing. But I just say to you, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. What's that power? Your faith, your willingness to be honest, naked, and real with God. Not religious, not all oh, glory to God. Oh, you're so good. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Hallelujah, hallelujah. No, sometimes you need to shut up the hallelujahs and cry your eyes out and say, Lord, I am jacked up. I need help. I'm in trouble. I don't want to ruin and, and, and injure other people because I'm walking around flinching and limping through life. Help me, Lord. I've been blaming everybody all my life. It's time for me to take responsibility. But I can't. Help me, Lord. I can't see my faults. They say I'm like this and they say I'm like that. I can't see it, Lord. Help me see me. Help me see where I need help. Bring it to my attention. I'm telling you, God will. He is more than willing. He, you know how the Bible says in Luke 12? Mm -hmm, how he's so excited to give you the kingdom? He is. He's tickled pink to use everyday language. He's tickled pink to heal your wounds. He's tickled pink to deliver you and free you. He's tickled pink to lift you out. See, you can be going through it, but you don't have to be feeling it. I was married eight years, eight years of adultery, second month of our marriage. My, my ex-husband was caught up in prostitution. But guess what? After three years, I gave it all to God. And it stopped hurting me. Totally. I started living the abundant life. It was no longer our problem. It was his problem. And I went on and did the business of my father. Prison ministry. Preaching. Convalescent homes. I was doing whatever the Lord laid on my heart and I was doing it joyfully because all the weights and sins that beset me were in his hands. I threw it all. I cast all my care on him. When you're convinced God loves you, that God is for you, you don't have to run around the psychic hotlines. You don't have to run around to your friends 
uh, uh, complaining about this one, complaining about that one, gossiping, telling their dirt. No, you don't have to do that. You can go straight to God and find the help you need. He is a very present help. Remember that. And I'm going to leave you with that because that's where we need to be in the presence of our very present help. Amen. God bless you as you seek God for his healing, as you seek God for his deliverance. Amen. Well, praise God.